Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG, as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs at CG. Besides the audience here tonight, we also have a global audience watching on the live webcast. Our topic this, after, this evening is Iran in the West, a dialogue of ambassadors, and will be presented by former American Ambassador Thomas Pickering and former Iranian Ambassador Hossein Musavian. Our featured speakers will be introduced more properly in just a few moments by our event moderators. Following today's address, we welcome your questions from the audience. Here in the CG Auditorium, you have question cards and pencils that we ask you to fill out and pass to the end of the aisle. We'll accept these at two different times this evening, once at 8 o'clock and again at 8.30. If you're watching online, you can ask questions through the live chat function on your screen and we'll transmit those questions to our panel. I'd like to thank CG's public event sponsors, 570 News and Wordsworth Books, and thank you for your continuing support. And I'd also like to acknowledge in our audience Peter Braid, elected member of parliament for Kitchener-Waterloo. Moderating this evening's discussion are Janet Lang, research professor at the Balsley School of International Affairs, and James Blight, the CG chair in foreign policy development at the Balsley School. Jim and Janet, who are <coughs> both colleagues and spouses, are also both award-winning authors, scholars, and experts in critical oral history. Recognized as world-leading specialists on American foreign policy during the Cold War and the Cuban Missile Crisis, they were heavily involved in the making of two recent award-winning films, The Fog of War, 11 Lessons from the Life of Robert S. McNamara, and Virtual JFK, Vietnam, If Kennedy Had Lived. They're the authors of several publications. They've led groundbreaking projects on preventing nuclear war, and they're continuing their research on the Cuban Missile Crisis through a new project called The Armageddon Letters, which you can learn more about by visiting www.armageddonletters.com. A recent focus of their research is U.S.-Iran relations since the Islamic Revolution, undertaken with colleagues at MIT and George Washington University. They came to Waterloo from Brown University not long ago, and we feel very lucky to have Jim and Janet conducting the research here at the CG campus, and we're fortunate to have them on stage tonight. So I ask that you please help me to welcome both Janet Lang and James Blight, who will introduce this evening's speakers. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Fred. Good evening on this fine winter's night in April. <laughs> and welcome to the CG campus and to the Balsillie School of International Affairs. I'm Jim Blight, as Fred has just suggested. Our subject is Iran and the West. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, it feels to us as if Iran, the West, and the entire world have arrived at a watershed moment. Perched on the edge of a precipice, this way leading to peace, that way leading to war. On the one hand, we wonder, dare we be hopeful about the talks that commence this coming Saturday between Iran and the so-called P5 plus one, permanent members of the UN Security Council, all nuclear powers, and Germany. On February 22nd, Iranian Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei reiterated his August 2005 fatwa concerning the prohibition of nuclear weapons, asserting that it is immoral, illogical, and sinful to, per, to possess nuclear weapons, and that Iran therefore does not seek such weapons. In response, as we are told, US President Barack Obama has sent a back-channel message to Hamane via the Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan, reportedly containing the following proposal. The US will tolerate a nuclear capable Iran as long as Iran devotes that program strictly to civilian use and is sufficiently transparent to allow inspectors to confirm this on a regular basis. So we ask at this treacherous moment, have Hamane and Obama broken the ice somehow? Does this exchange mean an agreement and thus peace may be possible? Can a war be avoided? Can decades of fear, loathing, and mistrust be overcome? Or will this initiative crash and burn as it has in the past, indeed, as it did last year? If the talks do collapse, many believe there will be war. Israel has threatened to attack Iran whether the US approves or not, or whether it participates or not. 
Such a war, it is widely believed, would plunge the Middle East into a chaotic bloodbath with vast implications not only for Iran and the Middle East, but for the entire world. Immense pressure is already being applied to Iran via a regime of sanctions imposed by the West, an action often described as a last-ditch effort to avoid a catastrophic war. Iran, for its part, has credibly threatened to respond mightily to such an attack, including, but not limited to, attempting to close the Strait of Hormuz through which nearly one quarter of the world's oil passes. With so much at stake and with such dire predictions of catastrophe in the event of war, why don't the potential combatants take a step back, pause, and engage each other on alternatives to war or capitulation? The brief answer seems to be that Iran and the West have become prisoners of their history. <clears throat> Stephen Kinzer, the distinguished New York Times foreign correspondent and the author of several books on Iran, has described the U.S.-Iran situation as the wor world's worst dysfunctional relationship between nations. How dysfunctional is it? I know of no better statement of the pitiful level of non-communication and ignorance that has plagued the relationship than that of John Limbert, a retired American diplomat, a former advisor to President R Barack Obama on Iran, who was also, from November 1979 until January 1981, held hostage by Islamic militants in and around the U.S. Embassy grounds in Tehran. Here are John Limbert's five rules of dysfunctionality that he contends have governed past negotiations, formal and informal, between Iran and the West. Rule number one, never walk through an open door. Instead, bang your head against a wall. Rule number two, never say yes to anything the other side proposes because doing so will make you look weak. Three, always assume the other side is infinitely hostile, devious, domineering, and irrational, and that it is in fact the embodiment of evil. Four, always assume that anything the other side proposes must contain some kind of a trick, that its only purpose in life, actually, is to cheat you. Five. Whenever you seem to be succeeding, take a deep breath, close your eyes, and when you open them, accuse the other side of a conspiracy so vast, of coincidences so improbable that you are convinced that this time the evil adversary is out not just to make you look bad, not just to embarrass you or trap you, this time he is out to totally destroy you. These are the conclusions of a U.S. diplomat, fluent in Farsi, married to an Iranian woman who has spent the better part of the last 40 years working in and around <coughs> Iran. To succeed in the negotiation set to begin on Saturday in Istanbul, the principal parties around in the United States have to break all these rules. Tonight, we are going to provide the negotiators in Istanbul with a model for how these rules can be productively broken by Iranian and American diplomats. We're going to show you that it can happen. Our guests will engage each other in a dialogue dedicated to helping us understand how Iran and the West got to where they are now, bitter enemies, full of mistrust, unyielding in their positions, and maybe even willing, so it seems, to go to the brink of catastrophic war, or maybe even over that brink, as a matter of inclination and a matter of policy. I've told our guests that they can begin their discussion by focusing on the present moment and working their way back through some of that history that has brought us to this point, or they can begin with the history and work their way forward as they see fit. The conversation you're about to witness and then later participate in will be relatively unstructured and informal. It will be a dialogue of the sort we hope transpires at the official level between Tehran and Washington beginning on Saturday. We will leave a substantial portion of our time for our guests to respond to questions from the audience. Volunteers will be passing out pencils and paper on which we ask you to write a brief question and pass it to the aisle, either aisle, where the volunteers will retrieve them. Please specify if your question is for Ambassador Musavian or Ambassador Pickering or both. The volunteers will deliver them to the aforementioned Janet Lang, who will, according, uh, who will organize them according to theme and give them to our guests who will answer them to the best of their ability, or since they are professional diplomats, pretend to answer them to the best of their ability. 
It is a great pleasure now to formally introduce my fellow panel members. Janet M. Lang is a research professor at the Balsillie School and the History Department at the University of Waterloo. She has two books coming out in the next six months, Becoming Enemies, U.S.-Iran Relations in the Iran-Iraq War, 1979-1988. That'll be published in June, and the Armageddon Letters, How Kennedy, Khrushchev, and Castro Saved Us in the Cuban Missile Crisis which will be published shortly before the 50th anniversary in October. I had the distinct honor to assist her on both of these books. <laughs> Janet will take charge of the Q&A period at w with which we will conclu conclude the evening. Like the other members of this panel, Janet considers herself a moderate. I have insider knowledge gained over 36 years of our marriage <laughs> and collaboration that she is indeed moderate on some subjects. <laughs> But these do not include <laughs> sports teams from her hometown of Boston, <laughs> where she takes no prisoners, nor the proper way to make red sauce for pasta, where there is only one way, and that's mom's way. <laughs> Sayed Hossein Musavian is currently a visiting research scholar at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. Hossein has worked as a journalist, diplomat, nuclear negotiator, and scholar over the course of a distinguished career. From 1980 to 1990, he was editor-in-chief of the Daily Tehran Times. By the end of the 1980s, he was director general of the Western European Department of the Iranian Foreign Ministry. He subsequently served as ambassador to the newly reunified Germany from 1990 to 1997 and later as head of the Foreign Relations Committee of the Supreme National Security Council. From 2005 to 2008, Hussein served as vice president of the Center for Strategic Research, a foreign policy think tank quite like CG next door that Janet and I had the privilege to visit in 2008. In April 2007, he was arrested and charged with actions contrary to Iran's national security interests. He was cleared on charges of espionage and revealing secret documents to Western officials, but given a two-year suspended jail sentence and barred for five years from serving in Iran's diplomatic corps because of his opposition to the nuclear and foreign policy of the administration of President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Thomas R. Pickering is currently vice chair of Hills & Company, an international consulting firm providing advice to U.S. businesses focused on emerging market economies. Ambassador Pickering is one of the most honored Foreign Service officers in U.S. history. During a Foreign Service career of more than 40 years, he served as ambassador to, in chronological order, Jordan, Nigeria, El Salvador, Israel, the United Nations, India, and Russia. He retired in 2000 as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, he holds the personal rank of career ambassador, the highest in the U.S. Foreign Service. Tom has been centrally, I would even say heroically, involved in our project on Iran and the West, Janet's and mine, from its inception in 2006. According to his State Department resume, Tom speaks French, Spanish, Swahili, Arabic, and Hebrew. Tonight, however, we have asked him to limit himself to his native New Jersey English. <laughs> <laughs> a language he shares with two other New Jersey heroes of Janet and me, that would be John Stewart and Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> now, to begin, I'd like to invite Hussein and Tom to begin to mix it up. The floor is yours. I understand that Tom lost the flip of the coin, and therefore he goes first. Please. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Jim and Janet, very much for inviting us here. And let me tell you what an honor and pleasure it is to be back on a platform again with a person I'm privileged to call a friend and someone who I admire and respect and who's taught me a great deal, Hussein Boussavian, who, uh, from whom you will shortly hear. Jim has introduced us with multiple challenges out ahead. Uh, let me just state at the outset that I believe that our relationship has been characterized, indeed our non-relationship has been characterized by mistrust, which goes deep, fed by misunderstanding, which relates very heavily uh, to the fact that 
each side is left to interpret the actions and the roles of the other side on the basis of distance and non-conversation rather than the alternative. It is my view that a war would be a huge, tragic mistake and that we must strive to move toward diplomacy, toward dialogue, toward conversation and negotiation, something that has eluded us for a long period of time. Our relationship, and I studied history, so I'm going to begin back and come forward, has been characterized over the years, particularly since the Iranian Revolution, with a long series on both sides of actions by the other which are considered to be hostile, unthinking, unsympathetic, unfeeling, remote, and unproductive. One can only begin to glean a little bit of the understanding of this if I mention on the Iranian side that there is a deep sense of mistrust in large measure heightened by the recent conflict in Iraq and the ongoing conflict in Afghanistan, by the sense that Iran has been the victim in many ways of a byproduct of the Afghan conflict, the drug trade, where large numbers of Iranians have suffered death in protecting their country against the trade. But this is the very tip of the iceberg. There is much more that goes very deep from Mossadegh to the Vincennes uh, to very strong support as Iran perceived it for Iraq in the eight-year war launched by Saddam Hussein against Iran in the early part of the 1980s to unsettled and very difficult problems remaining from the days of the Shah over money uh, taken by the United States for contracts and still unresolved as a result of long-standing efforts in The Hague to try to bring this to conclusion. This is not, however, a one-sided issue of mistrust or misunderstanding. There are difficulties as well on the United States side of this issue, having to do with the hostages at our embassy, having to do in many cases with other areas of misunderstanding and difficulty, uh, certainly uh, support by Iran for organizations we term terrorists, Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas in Gaza, a uh, deep sense of concern that Iran has been quite implacably against a Middle East peace negotiation in the past by statements of President Ahmadinejad about the Holocaust and about Israel, and a number of other things that we could go on. And our purpose tonight is not to heighten or indeed strengthen some implausibly obtruse, abstruse argument about the nature of the past so much as it is the charge that you, Jim, and you, Janet, have given us to grapple with the future. We're on the verge of potentially a breakthrough or a breakdown. It will begin on Saturday in Istanbul. It has to do with an effort once again to bring both sides together. I've specifically, not until this moment, talked about the nuclear problem, which is the centerpiece of US and Western concern about Iran, uh, because, in fact, it is one of a number of issues, and if we don't understand that a relationship between the West and Iran has to be built, moving toward a resolution of all of these issues, we don't understand yet the problem. Istanbul will focus heavily on nuclear. In the West, we have been deeply concerned by Iran's program, particularly before 2003, by actions now termed by the International Atomic Energy Agency, the UN Inspection Watchdog, as possible military dimensions. Uh, this wonderful aphorism, in fact, relates to research and development and experimentation in items which would act as neutron initiators of an atomic weapon as well as research in the high explosives designed to compress the fissile material in the nuclear weapon, as well as dealings with Mr. A.Q. Khan from Pakistan, who was, in fact, a proliferator for profit, uh, and deep concerns about why in a country 
uh, with tremendous energy resources is there all this concentration on producing low enriched uranium for which there is no ostensible purpose at the moment. The only reactor in Iran has been provided by Russia and Russia insists on providing the fuel and indeed taking away the spent fuel. On the Iranian side, there is a deep sense in my view of great concern that American actions in principle, perhaps aided and abetted by the West, have been designed to affect a regime change. That the answer from the point of view of the United States and perhaps from Israel uh, to Iran is regime change. A deep concern that Iran would wish to be anointed as hegemon of the Middle East by the United States and others and allowed to do what it might, uh, despite the fact that there are serious relationships of the West with the Arab part of the Middle East and both Iran and the Arab part of the Middle East to share still a great responsibility to the world community in providing energy resources. The negotiations about to take place are the product of many failed tries. And indeed, one of the inordinately difficult parts of the problem has been that it has been as hard to make progress as it has been to get to the table. And without making this too much of a caricature, Iran and the United States have had a tendency, along with the other members of the P5, uh, to meet maybe once or twice a year at a maximum for one day only. And the process has been for one side or the other to put a proposal before the table and to have the other side reject it in accordance with Limbert's rules. And then they walk away and spend the next eight to 10 months negotiating a new meeting at which the same dance uh, is repeated. Hopefully this time, with the careful preparation that has gone in on the part of President Obama, and I think equally uh, from Ali Khamenei, the Supreme Leader of Iran, we will have a chance to see that real negotiations that give and take could take place. How and in what way that will begin is very difficult, but it has always seemed to me that to solve the entire problem in one go is a chimera, a fool's paradise, that we need to go by steps and stages. And that interestingly enough, Iran has put within last months an idea on the table that it would be prepared to stop enriching uranium <clears throat> to 20% in return for the West being able to provide the fuel for a research reactor provided to the Shah by the United States which makes medical isotopes and the absence of fuel for which has been the reason why Iran has said it has to enrich to 20%. And that causes problems because in the physics of enrichment it is more than halfway. Uh, to the material that could be used in a nuclear weapon, which again raises the problems of deep misunderstanding and mistrust. I'll stop here by only repeating that there is an opportunity. It will not be easy. Negotiations will be hard. Uh, but I'm hopeful that with my friend Hussein, as we get into this, we can examine some thoughts and ideas that might provide some bridging thoughts or bridging ideas. I hasten to add, I'm retired. I represent nobody but myself. I have perhaps almost no influence on how and in what way governments will take this, except for the opportunity uh, to megaphone the ideas through your good questions and this good audience. Thank you. Thank you, John. Hussein, you won the flip, and so you get to go second. First of all, let me thank all of you, Jim, Janet, and specifically Tom. Uh, the problems between Iran the, uh, and the West, I think, is a mixture of uh, mistrust, misunderstanding, miscalculations, and uh, misperceptions. Rightly, Tom mentioned the, the mistrust. I believe the first and the most important issue for Iran and the West is to understand the mistrust is mutual. Iranians also, they have their own legitimate 
reasons for mistrust. Working for a quarter of century with Western countries to improve the relations, 90%, 95%, maybe 99% of the public opinion, media, politicians in the West, always they concentrate on the reasons the West cannot trust Iran. And we need a balance first. First of all, to understand the mistrust is mutual. Second, to help the public, and, uh, public opinion to understand. Iranians also, they have their own reasons. Tom mentioned in 1953, when the West orchestrated to, uh, through a coup, to remove the first democratically elected uh, prime minister of Iran after centuries. When we are talking about democracy in Iran, the fact is that the democratically elected administration prime minister was removed uh, by the Western countries, specifically the US and the UK. For a quarter century, the West supported a dictator. I mean, during 25 years, there was no democracy, no freedom, a brutal dictator, and the West was supporting. Right after the war, uh, after the revolution, we had a war. Everybody is talking about Iranian hegemony, but the reality is right after the war, after the revolution, an Arab country invaded Iran. And the whole international community, not only the Arab neighbors, which the GCC countries, they just paid $100 billion to support the invasion. But the US, Europeans, Soviet Union, the East Bloc, West Bloc, they all supported the aggressor a war which led to the death of 300,000 Iranians. The, 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 the impact of the, the terrible terrorist attack 9-11 with, I don't know, 3,000, 4,000 victims, then you can compare the scale when Iran had 300,000 and over a million injured during eight years war, which the West was supporting the aggressor to disintegrate Iran and to change the regime. Just after the time Iranians made a revolution to remove a dictator, like what the Egyptians they did to remove Mubarak. And worse, during the war, Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons the first use of weapons of mass destruction after the Second World War, which the West provided material and technology. And either was supportive in practice or was quiet. Thousands of Iranians, they were victims of chemical weapons. Even during the war, somehow the US participated in military strike when they had a, a, a military strike again, against Iranian oil platforms, when they shot down a, a passenger airplane, killing 290 innocent Iranians during the war over the Persian Gulf, including 66 children, even with no one small apologize from Iranian nation. After the war, when Rafsanjani came uh, to power as president, it was the time I was general director of West Europe in the foreign ministry, working with him for four years in parliament. When he was the speaker of parliament, I was the head of administration, his deputy, for four years. I knew him very well. His strategy was to forget the hostilities 
after revolution. To remove the tensions, to rebuild the relations with the West, including the US. I mean, when, when Jim, you mentioned Iranians and Americans, they are hostage of their past history. That the fact is right after such a horrible history between Iran and the US supporting the aggressor after uh, revolution, the Iranian president decided to uh, change the relation between Iran and the West. And the, the, the first, I think, and the golden opportunity for him and for the US was uh, the, the offer by President Bush, goodwill begets goodwill. And when President Bush offered Tehran to, to, to use your influence to free Western hostages, including American hostages, and promise to uh, reciprocate with much greater goodwill. Iran trusted. It was the time the leader could never trust and was telling everybody, do not trust Americans. Go to support the release of innocent civilians, Westerns, including Americans, but not because you should trust what the American president is telling, just because of humanitarian value. Nevertheless, Rafsanjani was hoping for a, a change, a major change in Iran-West relations, made it. And the US president not only did not reciprocate, but I think uh, they, they, they increased the pressures after the last US hostages were, was, was freed in Lebanon. This is not the only example during President of Sanjani. I just want to, to not to talk too much about the, mis the, about the mis opportunities. In 2005, 2001, I think Iran was uh, uh, among the first country to immediately to react to 2001 uh, uh, terrorist attack, condemned the terrorist attack September 11, and when the U.S. asked all countries to join U.S. war on terror to combat Al Qaeda and terror uh, and, and uh, Taliban, I think the U.S could win Afghanistan because of Iran's cooperation. And right after the US was able, just due to Iranian cooperation, to remove Taliban and uh, Al-Qaeda, President Bush immediately, just within two or three weeks, rewarded Iran with access of evil. During President Ahmadinejad, I completely understand the negative consequences of rhetorics like what Tom mentioned about Holocaust wiping Israel off the map. But despite very radical rhetoric, in practice, I believe Ahmadinejad has uh, done more than all his predecessors to approach the US. The amount of official approaches, not only the letter he wrote to President Bush, which was the first Iranian president who wrote official letter to a US president, not only his letter to President Obama, not only uh, the, the congratulation letter to Obama, the, the, the ambassadorial meetings in Baghdad in 2007 to discuss Iraq crisis, the Geneva talks, the highest ranking official meetings ever between Iran and the US, between Jalili and Bill Burns in Geneva 2009, and I think 100 times more in uh, uh, confidential messages and second track meetings and one and a half track meetings. It means the meetings 
tens of meetings which the Iranian officials during Ahmadinejad's uh, era met with former uh, American officials. The meetings which Americans, they were not ready to send officials, but Iranians, they, they, they bought the risk and at very high level, Iranian officials, they, they participated. That's why I call it one and a half track. Uh, in in uh, February 2011, it was his administration who uh, invited in a meeting in Sweden, the deputy foreign minister of Iran invited, uh, proposed uh, to the uh, American participants uh, for Iran to invite officially Mark Grossman to, in, uh, to, to visit Tehran to discuss U.S.-Iran cooperation on Afghanistan, which the U.S. declined. In early summer 2011, Iran responded positively to Russian step-by-step -step plan, which all experts, they, 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 they have consensus that the Russian step-by-step -step plan uh, includes, covers, all requirements of the IAEA resolutions and the United Nations Security Council resolutions. Iran responded positively, the West declined. And in September 2011, I think he came here to New York with two olive branches, one offering the international community that Iran is a ready. Quick, oh, no, I, I explained to him beforehand that New York is not in Canada. <laughs> uh, and that we had just sort of gotten that drilled into ourselves <laughs> along the way. Sorry. He came for uh, United Nations uh, uh, meetings in, in New York. And <laughs> he offered the international community to, uh, uh, for Iran to stop 20% enrichment if the P5 plus one, five permanent members plus Germany, provide Iran the fuel route for Tehran research reactor. This offer was rejected. And also he announced to American public and politicians that Iran would free the hikers. But even despite all of such overtures Ahmadinejad made in 2011, the, the, the uh, American Western uh, rewards, reactions was completely negative. Uh, more sanctions, sanctioning central bank, sanctioning oil, uh, UN uh, resolutions condemning Iran on human rights, on terrorism, all this came after uh, the overtures he made. Therefore, uh, during different administrations, I am convinced uh, the Iranian uh, uh, administrations, either Rafsanjani or Khatami or Ahmadinejad, they have done a lot to approach the U.S., but they all have failed. The major concern, Tom is right, the core issue with the Iranian supreme leader about the uh, U.S. objective toward the Islamic Republic of Iran is uh, regime change. Since his leadership 1989, he always maintains that the real strategy of the U.S. is regime change. And as long as the U.S. is after regime change, why you are talking about rapprochement? They are really concerned about the U.S. intention to dominate Iran, interference. He considers uh, the dual track policy, most of the Iranian politicians, a symbol of insincerity. They believe if they are really sincere, why they are using a dual track policy, which 99% is pressure, 1% is diplomacy. And this is not President Obama's policy. I believe all US administrations since Revolution 1979, they have had the same policy. Once they have branded as dual containment, once they have branded as uh, carrot and sticks, this one branded as dual uh, track, but all have been the same. 
unfortunately 99% in my understanding for coercion, pressures, sanctions, covert actions, and 1% for union diplomacy. That's why I believe uh, you would never find uh, a train can run in dual track. If you can find, the US strategy also would be successful on Iran. Sanctions, of course, would, would harm Iranian nations. But one thing the West should understand, Islamic Republic has, be, has grown with sanctions and pressures for 33 years. The minimum advantage for them is to know how, how they should resist the sanctions and pressures. The other main issue, I believe, is if with the Western approach toward Iran is the West policy always has been based on a piecemeal approach, minimalist approach, strategy. While from, from uh, the time after uh, war with Iraq, um, I believe all Iranian administrations, they have been looking for a broader uh, compromise, comprehensive package, maximalist approach toward the West and the US. And when Tom mentioned about the nuclear issue and Istanbul discussion on the nuclear issue, I think this is the key point. If again the US and the P5 plus one, they go with Iran, uh, to Iran in Istanbul to ask just one step and do not discuss the broader package because Iranians always they want to see the end game because they have failed for 30 years on step by step. I mean, step by step, which you only discuss the first step and you never discuss the second step. They want to see the whole roadmap, the end game, the end state. And I think this is something we can discuss more. Thank you. <clears throat> At a uh, conference uh, almost exactly uh, a year ago, where these two distinguished gentlemen participated with us. Um, Hossein at one point surprised everybody by asking to intervene and saying that he had uh, a list of missed opportunities. Not that one side missed them all and the other side didn't, but um, uh, there was considerable pushback and then pushback to the pushback. We had members of the Clinton administration, former members of the Clinton administration there, so I'm wondering if um, Tom, a former member of the Clinton administration, uh, could give us a little texture about how it looks and looked in Washington. Um, we now know from, or have heard from Hossein that it, it, I would put it this way, correct me if I'm wrong Hossein, but that you've been knocking on the door, knocking on the door, knocking on the door and you get the door slammed in your face over and over again um, on the th theory that it may not look exactly like that in Washington and that that may be part of what needs to be fixed here. I wonder if you could help us on that. I will, Jim. I think that it is, in my view, not very edifying and not very useful to dwell on the mistakes of the other. Yep. But let me tell you that I have equal chapter and verse for all of Hussein's. And I don't want to dwell extensively. I will say two things. One, it's been very clear, and I've said this many times before, an old Iranian friend of mine said that, look, when we're ready, you're not. When you're ready, we're not. <laughs> we ought to find a way to bring the curves together or words to that effect. And so that's what we're working on, and that's the direction in which we go. There's no question at all, as a member of the Clinton administration, I participated, indeed, uh, I was at one time suggested to the Iranians, along with a small team as the negotiating group that could sit down with the Iranians and begin to talk, for which we never got an answer. Uh, but the world is replete. They made proposals in 2003, which Secretary Rice denies ever seeing. Uh, we can go on in this way. This is not a one-sided proposition, and I think Hussein and I 
have a tendency to agree to that. Each side has its own list yep. of missed opportunities, of grievances, of difficulties. Uh, the really interesting question is, can you change the dynamic? Is there a way to move ahead? There, I think, two things have to prevail. One, the creation of trust by, in effect, putting between the two a sense that agreement can not only work, but continue. I can remember uh, the book, indeed, that Jim Dobbins, a very old friend of mine, wrote. Jim was our negotiator in Bonn in 2002, along with a very important Iranian delegation, and they worked very closely together to help reach agreement in the international community about the future government of Afghanistan, which became uh, the Karzai government. And two things happened, one trivial but important, and that was when they were discussing the question of what should be the objectives of the new uh, Afghan government that the international community would support after a long discussion, it was the Iranians who suggested democracy. Now, I don't want to get the Iranians in trouble at home, but it was an important suggestion. Maybe tongue in cheek, but nevertheless, hmm. not unrealistic. But the second piece was extremely important, but dealt with by the United States is very trivial because when the negotiations were over, Jim came back to Washington with a written suggestion by Iran that we seek now to broaden the negotiations and the discussions to cover a wider range of areas. And that somehow got no attention at all in the United States. So in effect, we have seen in each of these kinds of efforts an inability to move beyond uh, uh, John Limbert's rules. And I think that you were wise to put them on the table and I think it's important uh, to begin to see how you do that. But the way you do that is you pick something you can get some an agreement on, and you put that agreement in place, and then you couple that with an agreement to go to the next stage. And it appears to me that in the end, it's simple to say that what we would like to achieve just on the nuclear file is an end state in which Iran makes it very clear that the fatwa on nuclear weapons remains and will remain their policy uh, unless something fundamentally changes. That uh, Iran will be recognized as a state entitled to enrich, but to enrich to meet its needs for a civil nuclear power program, and there'll be agreement on what those needs will be that Iran will suggest, accept, and the International Atomic Energy Agency will propose an effective monitoring and transparency system uh, to deal with making sure, in fact, that those commitments are kept. And that's not singling out Iran. Every other state has got uh, IAEA administered inspection systems to ensure that it is keeping its commitments, now increasingly including the five recognized nuclear powers on the non-proliferation treaty, and that the sanctions will fall away. And it seems to me this is the end state in which you get. In the meantime, we should be working, in my view, perhaps independently, but nevertheless equally assiduously on the non-nuclear files, the ones that I mentioned at the beginning, as a way to begin to take the misunderstanding, the mistrust, the venom, all of the problems out of those sets of issues to the extent that we can. We did that in the United States in 1971, beginning in 71 with China. And it was a hard and difficult course. And we didn't agree on everything. We still don't agree on Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, and we managed to, in fact, do two things. We managed to resolve step by step a lot of outstanding questions, and we managed to agree to disagree which is different than disagreeing, over issues we could not resolve, but we did not wish to see generate physical conflict, that we could keep the conflict intellectual and rhetorical, but not physical, and we could see different paths to solution for those conflicts. To me, that's the kind of end state that we ought to seek to move ahead, and it is not, in my view, difficult 
for the United States to explain that to Iran, and if Iran has a different conception, to explain it to the United States. So it is, in my view, good to begin with a small step, very important to look at what the end of the nuclear negotiations would have to be from the perspective of both sides and say, is this agreeable or not agreeable? And to look at how and in what way we go about working together, because it's a huge task uh, to begin to work on the other issues. Nobody expects this is going to happen overnight. Nobody expects that it's going to be miraculously resolved. But I think everybody expects that the parties are going to keep their nose to the grindstone. They are not going to do this one-off annual meeting exercise and then castigate each side the other uh, for whatever failures they may want to impute as a way of dealing with the problem. One final point. Both sides have internal politics. We are, in my country, in case you hadn't noticed it from this vast distance, having an election. <laughs> it's not an easy time. The opposition tends to believe that it can gain as a result of castigating the administration of the United States, which chooses to pursue diplomacy as pursuing appeasement. We have a very difficult issue because our friend and ally in Israel, and I have, I've been ambassador to Israel, I know it well, I have lots of differences and I have lots of things to say about it, but it, it, it understands that our friend and ally in Israel is feeling, for its own political reasons, particularly pressed. So that doubles the complications we have to deal with. Uh, President Ahmadinejad and the Supreme Leader have not been on what you and I would call, and Hussein can correct me, Tea Party terms, not in the traditional American sense, but in the traditional British sense. <laughs> And this means, in fact, that each side is looking to its own constituencies, however it chooses to deal with them, as not being beyond influence at this very difficult moment. So the moment isn't an easy one, and it isn't easy just to say, well, we just do what Hussein and Tom Pickering say, and it'll be all easy and we'll come through. We appreciate the difficulties that each side has to, has to deal with. One of the... Uh terms that's often used when people try to come to grips with what's wrong or what has been wrong, why hasn't it been possible to make some progress? Why do things seem never to change, actually? Why is this history so relevant? Why hasn't it been transcended? Is the role of what are called spoilers, uh, which generally seems to mean people who have a vested interest in the relationship remaining more or less the way it is. Hostile, threatening, uh, keep the wagon circled, and uh, keep the volume of the rhetoric as high as possible. This is part of what Tom's referring to as internal politics. Mitt Romney took about five minutes once the word got out that there was this message from Obama through Erdogan to the Supreme Leader to say two things. One, uh, that if Obama is reelected, Iran will have a nuclear weapon the next year, and if I am elected, I will see to it by ordering a military attack on Iran that it won't ever have a nuclear weapon. Now that's very predictable. It's in tune with the kind of lunatic reality of American electoral politics <clears throat> these days. But I can imagine Hussein that that kind of comment when it resonates and reverberates in Tehran, creates big problems for people who would really like to see uh, a change for the better, a change into a, more, into a less combative relationship with the U.S. as probably a prerequisite to reaching some kind of maybe grand deal at some point down the line. I think Americans, they have got enough lesson from Afghanistan and Iraq and I'm afraid neither Obama nor Mitt Romney would be in position to attack Iran. Because they know uh, the disastrous situation they have had for a decade in Afghanistan and Iraq, trillions of dollars of investments, thousands of lives, and now they have to leave Afghanistan and Iraq with a mess. 
no achievement. 4,000, 5,000 Americans, they have been killed. Three trillion dollars, 170,000 civilians in Afghanistan and Iraq. And the unfortunate issue is that they have not been able to manage stability and security. And the situation is much worse. They understand very well if they attack Iran, the consequences would be tenfold. But such as rhetoric definitely has very, very negative consequences in Tehran. The first lesson, all options on table, mm. is giving Iranians is that to hide your nuclear facilities. If they were shocked about Fardu, everybody, this was because of military threats. Otherwise, Iran had Natanz, and IAEA was always there, but it was vulnerable. The day they started to, to threaten Iran with military strike, then Iran decided to have the second enrichment facilities hmm. under the ground, which would not, the, the Israelis or Americans, they would not be able to attack. Therefore, they should be very careful about such a rhetoric. On the nuclear issue, uh, the first question is, what is the bottom line of the P5 plus one? If the bottom line is enrichment, there would never be a deal no, possible. No, no enrichment. Zero enrichment. If, if, if the bottom line is zero. zero enrichment. And maybe the final uh, result would be a confrontation. Because no Iranian administration, it doesn't matter, is conservatives, principalists, moderates, reformists, monarchies, clerics, they all have a red line. The legitimate rights of Iranian nation, like every other member state of NPT, to enjoy peaceful nuclear technology, which includes enrichment. This is a red line. This has been red line for Shah, and this has been the red line for Islamic Republic. If the red line of the P5 plus one is nuclear bomb, I'm really surprised why the P5 plus one or EU3 they have never gone to any negotiation table during nine years to tell Iranians, we recognize your rights, including enrichment, on their NPT, but we need such a commitment on transparency, ensuring international community that the Iranian nuclear program in the future would not divert toward nuclear weapon. The reason nine years of negotiation, nuclear negotiations have failed is exactly this. Never the P5 plus one or EU3 has been ready in official meetings to tell the Iranian side, we are ready to respect your rights, including enrichment on their NPT. They always have talked that we are ready to, to recognize your rights for civilian uh, nuclear programs, which they mean power plant. That the magic issue is enrichment. Yeah. And at the same time, they have never been able to, uh, uh, to, to define for Iran what do we expect you for transparency measures. If they go to Istanbul, in my understanding, with such a policy to tell Iranians, Iranians, they have three major issues which they would be ready to compromise, 
if these three major issues are included in any package. One is rights under NPT, which includes enrichment. Second is lifting the sanctions. Third is normalizing the Iranian nuclear file at the UN and at the IAEA. If the P5 plus one is in position to put these three major issues from Iranian side and whatever they want on transparency, confidence buildings, whatever, even all requirements mentioned in the IAEA resolutions, like additional protocol inspections, whatever they want. But I'm afraid what we are reading from the, the media, they go to Iranian side in Istanbul and they ask Iran just to stop 20%, to export all the stockpiles and nothing in reward, and even do not define the second and the third step, assuring Iranians that we have a proposal for you in response to transparencies, Finally, the sanctions would be removed, your rights would be recognized, and you would be like any, treated like any other member of uh, NPT. During President Khatami, when I was a member of nuclear negotiation team, they were telling us that if you implement additional protocol, this would be excellent confidence building measures. We said, okay, we implement it. Then they said, if you implement subsidiary arrangement, that would be excellent for transparency, confidence building measures. I said, okay, we are ready for transparency, we implement it. Then they said, because this is IAEA resolutions, just as a confidence building for a short period, you suspend it as a goodwill. We said, if it is non-legally binding, just for confidence building, and just for a negotiation period, for some months, we are ready to show this goodwill. After we did all, the Europeans came to Iranians after two years of suspension, and they said, okay, now if you want to have international community confidence, suspend it for indefinite period. Yeah. And such a political games and approaches has caused a, a major mistrust to Iranians. Iranian leader from the beginning told the nuclear negotiators, not only to us, to the nuclear negotiator, uh, negotiators after us, Larijani, and to the current nuclear negotiators. Iran is not seeking for nuclear bomb. Iran is ready for transparency up to the end. This is the two major elements. When uh, I'm reading uh, from, from uh, I think it was Hillary Clinton, saying that Iranian supreme leader sh should show in practice his fatwa, the validity of his fatwa. I really cannot understand when during the war, Iran was attacked by chemical weapon, and Iranian military army went to the supreme religious leader to get permission to reciprocate. And the supreme religious leader said, using weapons of mass destruction is haram, forbidden, and did not permit Iranian army to reciprocate. It was during the war. It was the time the enemy used chemical weapons. Iran did not reciprocate. How do you want Iran to, to give you guarantee? What, what guarantee is better than this evidence? Therefore, I think the major problem is within the P5 plus one. They are not united. Russians now, they have concluded the US and the West is not after a realistic resolution for nuclear issue. They are after regime change. It was stated by Putin, the prime minister, just two, three, four weeks ago, 
that under the guise of nuclear weapon, the West is after regime change. It was officially stated. This is the Russians, and I know this is the understanding of Chinese. Europeans, they are not united because uh, the, the, uh, France is emphasizing on zero enrichment to deprive Iran from its legitimate rights. Obama administration inside Washington has major challenges with Senate, Congress, APAC, Israel, Netanyahu, is not in position to go for a realistic package which includes the legitimate rights of Iran. Despite of all analysis, news you read about division inside Iran, cleavages inside Iran, I'm 100% sure whether you like it or not, Iranian supreme leader by constitution is the ultimate decision maker as in, and is in full command to decide if there is a realistic package which includes the rights of Iran for enrichment and in reward Iran would show all transparency measures. But whether Obama is in the same position to recognize the rights of Iran for enrichment, to lift the sanctions, to normalize the files, I really doubt it. Tom is right, this is before election, but still I have my doubts. Even the time there was some talks within administration in 2010 that ultimately we need to recognize the rights of Iran for enrichment. The administration was challenged. The US senators, they wrote letter to President Obama you, would never, you should never recognize the rights of Iran on enrichment. It was official letter by senators. It was the Israeli position. It was APAC position. That's why Obama administration, I think they didn't follow. I think the US within uh, its own administration is divided. The P5 plus one is divided. That's why they are not in position to put a, a, a comprehensive package which would include what Iran is asking on their NPT, nothing more. Iran is not asking anything beyond NPT, non-proliferation treaty. And to put whatever they want requirements on transparency measures. And this is, I think, the major issue. We're uh, close, Maybe but I not could, quite. Could I make just not, a, a few comments on this? I wish you would. Yeah. Um, Hussein is right. There are differences of view about zero enrichment. It's very interesting if you go to the Jerusalem Post of a week ago and look at the Israeli defense minister's proposals. Which Netanyahu rejected. That's all right. Yep. Yep. It's all right. There are divisions in Israel now. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Not such a bad idea. Yeah. Is it? He did not propose <laughs> zero enrichment, yeah. uh, which I think is, is quite interesting. I think that Hillary Clinton, in the end of February, made a very important statement, which in effect, in my interpretation, and I think everybody's interpretation, made it very clear that if we were able to get the right agreements with Iran, Iran's rights under the NPT, would be recognized, including the right to enrich. But including the right to enrich for civil nuclear purposes. Yep, definitely. And you and I agree on that. Yep. Five years ago, I and a group of friends made a proposal in a written article in New York, which in an exact way mirrors what it is that you, and I hope Iran, and I hope the United States will now endorse. We won't know the answer to that until we have made the attempt to try. Uh, you, more than anybody in the world, Hussein, because for, you come from a country in which negotiations for daily bread are a hallmark of the Iranian reality, you and I know that you don't put your last proposal on the table before you open the storefront door. 
But believe me, you Tom, put your last proposal on Tom, the table. Tom, Tom, it when is published. The, when the, the bread is in sight, it's published. The not published by anybody official. No, no, no. In proposals we made in 2003, mm -hmm. 2004, the ones that were ignored, which I fully agree should have been paid attention yes. to. It but is we're not published in, now. We're not in 2003, and we're not in 2004. Yep. We're dealing with difficult problems. Uh, you've been heavily influenced by press leaks, which, in my view, are designed to perform a political objective. Yep. Yep. You're right. uh, we can all think of what that political objective is. One is domestic and one is foreign. Yep. You're right. One is to influence the outcome of the negotiations in a way that will be more favorable. Another is obviously having to do with who emerges on top in an electoral race. Mm -hmm. And so everyone falls victim to these, and particularly so uh, as my own country is more and more divided between extremes and less and less united around a center, which I deplore. Uh, but I think that that's unfortunately a reality uh, that we will have to overcome. Uh, but I wanted to put on the table that there is and there are ways forward here. Uh, there are ways forward that I think can have to do with what it is both sides would like to see according to their professions of faith in these issues, but also are prepared to accept on the table uh, because we all know that even President Reagan believed in trust but verify. And that's kind of the way in which we have to proceed in these things. So I think there, there are opportunities here. I think there are opportunities to move beyond a pure, let's cut 20%, let's get your fuel for your reactor. If you cut out 20%, then the only uh, civil use that Iran has for enrichment is back to power reactor fuel three and a half to five percent. So there is a way to go back there. There is a way in my view, uh, and you know those as well as I do, Hussein, in the next period, uh, to deal not only with the continued enrichment to 20 percent, but to deal uh, with the large amount of 20 percent fuel that Iran has already made. If the West is going to provide the fuel for that reactor, then Iran can contribute that fuel to the West. Uh, they could convert it to 3.5% if they want to. There are all kinds of ways yep. to move that ahead. And this is a time when people of good intent and goodwill should put their thinking caps on and try to find the ways to move forward. Uh, my own view is the Israelis would like to close Fordu. I don't know what you mean by closing Fordu. It's a huge set of underground tunnels, apparently. What do you do, blow up the whole mountain, or what do you do? My own view is if Iran is enriching 20% inside the mountain, and it gives up enriching 20% inside the mountain, it should undertake not to do other things inside the mountain while we're, in fact, working on an answer to this problem. Uh, my own view is that, of course, the United States will ask for the moon before the storefront opens, before the bread goes on sale, uh, but I, earnestly hope that the United States will consider in return for real forward moves by Iran, perhaps freezing some of the sanctions for a while. And this would be, in my feeling, a forward step that would, that would enhance the value of negotiations and open the process to moving things down the road. Thank you, Tom. Um, I had this uh, kind of fantasy as you were talking here. I have uh, written down here, if we could get you two on the next plane to Istanbul, would CG pay for it? <laughs> uh, I'm sure CG could afford it, but <laughs> so I can travel economy. <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't know anything about the last part of that, I'm not sure. Uh, but I do see that Janet has a small library accumulating <laughs> over here. Torture <laughs> instruments. And so I think we, uh, with everybody's permission, we can turn this over to questions from the audience. We do indeed have a ton of questions. Thank you very much. What I'm going to do, uh, there are a couple of that are very specific, and I'm going to uh, get to those. A lot of them, there's a lot of overlap. So um, I'm assuming that I have your permission. What I'm going to do is sort of put a bunch together so that we can get a bunch of issues uh, out there on the table for Tom and uh, Hossein to respond to, um, and I think we'll be able to get a little bit of broader coverage that way to address many of the uh, issues that, that you've um, uh, written down here for us. So first, thanks. Uh, okay, so uh, one of them actually, though, 
picks up on something very specific that you said, Jose, which was that in your view, the uh, dual track approach is 99% uh, negative and 1% for, uh, um, diplomacy. for diplomacy, right. So the question that comes is uh, basically Ambassador Pickering, do you agree that that sort of is the dual track policy, uh, is it being perceived correctly in Tehran? And hmm. is that thought to be uh, effective in some way? Up until now, the facts indicate that during the Obama administration, I think we've had three meetings yeah. in the three plus years. And we've had innumerable numbers of sanctions, so I'll let you do the math. Yeah. The opportunity is ahead of us. And for the first time, as you reported, and I can only see, believe what I see in the press, uh, the president and the supreme leader have been in touch perhaps multiple times by personal letter. Uh, this is different than what has happened in the past. Uh, there are ideas on the table, uh, some of them uh, possible, some of them difficult, but they're out there. Uh, the president apparently sent a message through Prime Minister Erdogan in uh, Turkey. Uh, I see these as signs of seriousness. The Supreme Leader reiterated the fatwa and said the things that Jim said about it on, in effect, uh, ruling nuclear weapons out as an option for Iran. Uh, so there, the, the, president, the, the Supreme Leader noticed what the President had to say to the APAC meeting, where the president put the emphasis not on military action, but on diplomacy. So there are all these signs that are out there. We don't know what they mean until we see exactly what happens. Uh, I think both of us are right to be very guarded that you can change your behavior and do so, but Istanbul is the challenge. Uh, it is also true that someone of such elevated intelligence as Einstein said, if keep on doing the same thing and expect a different result is the definition of insanity. <laughs> so in effect, that also is out there. And let's hope in fact that there can be uh, a real negotiation as opposed to the mating dance of the Goonie Birds, which is what we have seen up until now. <laughs> I was, before you get to the birds, I was going to say you were doing a perfect lead-in into the next question, uh, Tom, but the birds are... Why do I get all the questions? Are a little sad. <laughs> no, actually, this, this one is, is for both of you, but no, it's, a, it's a good lead-in that comes in. Uh, basically, we have a number of people in the audience who uh, have been um, impressed, and I would say probably depressed, by the number of times uh, each of you have talked about difficulties in the past, uh, real serious difficulties, missed opportunities, and so forth. And so uh, various people had different ways of approaching it, but one person put it particularly in a pithy way is, is there any reason to hope that learning will occur? <laughs> Well, I joined the questioner in asking the same question. Um, I served in the Middle East for eight years, and I used to say in the Middle East, there were only two kinds of American diplomats, optimists and lunatics, and I wasn't ready to certify myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you have to gauge some, you have to work some side of the optimistic equation if you expect to get anywhere, if you spend your life examining the lessons of the past and blame it all on the other side and don't think about what it is you should be listening to from the other side. Uh, I, as a diplomat, used to believe I got paid exactly the same amount of money for listening as talking, but the former was much more instructive and much more valuable. Mm. And I found very quickly that when you listen, the first thing you heard was what the other person was saying, but if you listen long enough, Sometimes you could actually discover what they meant. And many times they were not sure what they meant. And so it took a lot of time and a lot of questions. But it's very significant that you try to work your way through until you find out what's really on their mind and what bothers them, then you can't figure out 
how it is that you can bridge the gap. You're still left with zero-sum diplomacy, which doesn't work. Uh, and you're out of the range of the potential for some kind of win-win diplomacy, whatever that might mean in a particular situation. And these are caricatures, obviously. Mm -hmm. They're not real-world situations. You have to look at the details for the real-world situation. So I remain optimistic, even if, in fact, uh, things fail. Uh, all of the other alternatives are so much worse than continuing to swat away. And I believe we have time. I believe we have significant time. I believe that no decision has been made by Iran. I believe that it'll take some time, even in fact, were a decision to be made, it would take some time to become effective. Uh, but uh, I think we need to do everything we can to reinforce the situation where there is all of the pressure on getting an agreement and not all of the pressure on regime change and isolation purely for, this, for, the, for its own sake. I think that too much of the pressure side and too little of the diplomacy side has meant in effect that the pressure can have its own negative results if you're not careful. That I've always believed the value of diplomacy was to use all of your leverage to point in a direction in which you thought the problem could be solved. That's what diplomacy is there for. That's why you work at it that way. And if you fail to open a door and you merely push people against a wall that isn't going to work, then you shouldn't expect to have the problem easily resolved. But I think there are signs out there that something like the deal can be made. Uh, I shy away, and that's a massive understatement, from the notion of a grand bargain. A grand bargain means that everything in the grocery store goes for a negotiated price. And you never get to the price because each issue gets more difficult to the other than the others. That's why I believe in stage by stage. Hussein quite rightly has said, we can't start stage by stage until we have some idea of which road it's going on. And I agree with him on that. But I think that there is a way to explain the road without having to negotiate all of the details of the final destination before you start down the road. And that's what's out there, I think, as the primary diplomatic problem on the process side that we face today. Hussein, do you want to So talk the grand about bargain in slow motion. I no, I think, grand I think agenda. Um, grand agenda. <laughs> Tom was in a class uh, which I was also teaching at Princeton University. We had the same debate. Finally, we concluded together. Yeah, none of this class. is unrehearsed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we concluded in the class that Iran and the US, they need to have a phased grand agenda. Yeah. It means they should have a comprehensive package, including all bilateral, regional, international issues all issues of concerns, disputes, and joint interests. But as a confidence building measures, this should be implemented uh, gradually, step by step, phased approach. I think this is uh, a very good conclusion for the future of Iran-US relations, if they really want to make a deal. Uh, but. Uh, what I said, 99% uh, pressure, sanctions, and 1% genuine diplomacy, I, I don't want to emphasize too much on the percentage, mm. but look President Obama's strategy on engagement. It is true. He was the only U.S. president who came, announced engagement policy, and specifically, he said, with no precondition, no threats, and to reverse the course of 30 years of hostilities for a good relation between Iran and the US. It was unique. But what is the conclusion? I think it was in December and once in January that he presented to international community to uh, more, I think, to his uh, Republican competitors, uh, the outcome, the achievement of his engagement policy. He said, I have been able to organize the most comprehensive sanctions ever 
worldwide against Iran. The most comprehensive unilateral sanctions, the most comprehensive multilateral sanctions, and I have made Iranian economy on the verge of collapse. When I came to office, Iran was united, now is divided. See, this is the achievement he is going to present as, as engagement policy. This is the problem Iranians have. Let me read just one statement the leader made Obama, about Obama's engagement policy. He said, we intended to be logical. If Obama really wants to change, we should see the changes in your behavior, not just in your talks. Have you changed the past US policy regarding the threats, pressures, sanctions, propaganda, animosity, and baseless accusations or unfreezing our assets? Where can we see the changes? This is the point. They want to see the changes in practice. Could I just say something here? Uh, the Supreme Leader is, of course, expressing a view, which is the opening of negotiations view. There may be no preconditions, but the other side really has to show us before we begin the process that it's serious by doing things that put on the table its genuine view. And I would say to Hussein, Obama could have made the same statement, but he didn't. And Obama didn't ask the Supreme Leader for preconditions. And it's important that as we get to negotiations, we stay away from those kinds of statements, which may be good for dealing with domestic diplomacy like Obama's success of sanctions policy. But it isn't necessarily good for conditioning negotiations as we go ahead. The repetition of the fatwa, the statement that he recognized Obama had made some changes in his approach at the APAC meeting, were all valuable and were all useful. And those are the kinds of things that I think will condition where the process is. And I agree that some small signs and some small steps could be helpful. Uh, I think two letters or whatever number of letters and messages between Obama and the Supreme Leader are part of the process here. So I tend to want to focus as much as I can on what are the elements that make for positive. But I am very happy also to focus on items which the other side either misperceives or takes as some, somehow uh, designed uh, to create friction or problems. And I can understand, if I were living in Iran today, the impact of the sanctions. And that's why I have always said two things. One, if you're going to use pressure for negotiations, you've got to open the door. You can't keep the valve on the pressure cooker tied down and continue to turn up the heat without an explosion. Secondly, any wise negotiator will not use all of his leverage to get to the table when he suddenly knows that when he's at the table, he's also got to be persuasive. And that involves many different aspects of how to negotiate. And he can't do so if, in fact, he's exhausted every other opportunity he has to bring home to the other side that he is serious about accomplishing an objective. Okay, uh, segue, sort of involving that, um, involving a number of issues that both of you have drawn on. Uh, so it's a two-part question. One is uh, with regard to the upcoming meeting in um, Istanbul. Uh, Tom, you had described the, uh, the past history as you have one meeting, you propose something, they say no, and you take eight months to work out when the next meeting is. So people in the audience want to know, uh, are there genuine reasons to feel like this won't be same old, same old again uh, on both sides uh, there? And secondly, uh, complicating that, or the question is, does it complicate this whole thing, is the role of 
domestic politics. And here are people, again, I'm combining a few, but they're asking about not just the US domestic politics, uh, but also they're asking about are there domestic politics in Tehran that uh, possibly can be complicating factors as well that we just don't know about? Of course, uh, Tehran also has domestic issues like every other country. But on the nuclear issue for Istanbul, I have uh, three uh, reasons to trust Iran is ready for a real deal. Hmm. Three. Today, three. And you'll share them with us. Yeah. Good. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 key, the key issue, I think, in the P5 plus one meeting on Saturday, they are going to concentrate is 20%. Asking Iran to stop 20%. But it was Iran in February 2010, for the first time, proposed that Iran is ready not to enrich beyond 3.5% or 5%. That time, the US and Europeans, they believed Iran does not have, have capability mm. and technology to enrich. Right. Iran needs fuel rod, therefore we should reject the proposal. Mm -hmm. They rejected. Iran made the 20%. In September 2011, Iran told the international community, the P5 plus one, see, I have the 20%. I am ready to stop 20%, cap at 5%, if you provide the fuel rods. Again, the impression, understanding in the US and in the EU countries was that Iran does not have capability and technology to build the fuel rods. That's why they didn't buy the deal. Three months later, Iran built the fuel rod, tested the fuel rod. Today, when Iran has the 20% already, has reached, and has built already the fuel rods. And the consequences for Iran, Iran has paid huge prices, sanctions, oil, central bank, tens of billions of dollars of cost. Now they want to go to Istanbul to ask Iran, stop 20%, because now we are convinced you can make it. Please export whatever stockpile you have and we would give you fuel rods. Iran already has it. And who is going to compensate the, the, the consequences Iran has had? And who was rejecting the offer from the beginning? Therefore, mistrusting Iran on 20% is a mistake. Iran was the first partner who offered. We are ready not to go beyond 5%. It was the P5 plus 1 rejected. The second reason is the Russian proposal just in September 2011. This proposal, as I said, consists of all requirements of the IAEA and the United Nations Security Council. It's about additional protocol, subsidiary arrangements, the IAEA questions on possible military dimensions, even this proposal is asking Iran beyond the requirements of the IAEA and the United Nations Security Council, because it's asking Iran to cap at 5%, which is not the requirement of mm -hmm. the, the, the IAEA, asking Iran to stop at one enrichment site, asking Iran not to install new centrifuges, and even at the end of this proposal is suspension for Iran for three months. Iran responded positively to such a proposal which even requires beyond the IAEA and the United Nations Security Council demands. But it was the West rejected. And more explicitly in practice, in August 2011, the IAEA delegation visited Tehran. They were supposed to be in Tehran for two, three days. When they arrived, 
The Iranian side told them, you have blank check to visit wherever, whatever you want in Iran. No restrictions. They changed their program and they stayed for eight days in Iran. And they asked Iran to visit the R&D of heavy water project in Iraq. They opened the R&D for the IAEA delegation, they visited. They asked Iran to open the R&D for new generation centrifuges. They opened it and the IAEA could visit. These uh, inspections could be only done in the framework of additional protocol while Iran was not implementing additional protocol. At the end of the visit, the head of Atomic Energy Organization told the IAEA delegation that we are ready to give you five years full supervision. The reason we gave you one week full access in order to convince you, to, to ensure you that we are sincere. Practically, what we did in one week, we are ready to continue for five years in case when the IAEA's technical questions, ambiguities are removed, you also normalize the file, lift the sanctions, and recognize our rights. The IAEA delegation was extremely happy. When they came back to Vienna, Europeans and Americans, they rejected. I think these are practical steps Iran already has taken, practically. And that's why Again, I reiterate, if there is a realistic package which includes the three major issues Iran is focusing, and in reciprocation, whatever Iran should do for confidence building, for transparency, there would be definitely a deal in Istanbul. John, do you want to briefly? Yes, um, so we do have. I already, in response to the original question, I think laid out some of the reasons why one could see a slight difference in the approach of the parties to these negotiations. Uh, Hussein has brought in a number of very interesting points and a number of interesting ideas. Uh, the United States reaction to the Russian proposal, and this is on the record, was that steps and stages are a good idea and they make sense. The United States felt that the way the Russian proposal was put together, there was much more sanctions relief in the early portion and very little performance by Iran from its lights. And this is the reason why it didn't accept the deal as put on the table, but neither has Iran accepted the deal as put on the table. Where I fault the United States in particular, but also Iran, was an unwillingness to engage in working out the details and the steps and stages and how the various sanctions relief proposals would be accommodated within the broader Russian proposal. Uh, to me, this is a failure of diplomacy. Uh, I think that both sides share it to some extent, uh, but it doesn't help to blame both sides for something No, that this is what worked. we need in Istanbul. Exactly. We are going to say but what can be a model in Istanbul. Istanbul. And I, we're not going to negotiate all the pieces of the Russian proposal or some alternative. Uh, but I think we can point to what the end state ought to be in a way that is significantly clear enough. I laid out some ideas uh, that can convince both sides that if those objectives are accepted and working toward them in good faith is the way to make progress, then that helps both countries or both pieces or both sides of this discussion understand where things are going. So I think that part is important. Uh, I think the Russians made a contribution. Uh, somehow we need to pick up on the pieces that are out there and get people to begin to work on it. Uh, and I for one failed to see why uh, various times various parties have rejected proposals. Some of it has to do with domestic problems some of it has to do, as Hussein said, uh, with belief that since they technically aren't going to get there anyway, there's no reason to accept something on the table or it's too hard 
or it breaches a principle which is in dispute in one side or the other. Um, I would just say also one fuel rod doesn't make a summer. And the usual practice in the United States built the original reactor is something like a two year test period mm -hmm. to make sure in fact the fuel rods are gonna work okay. And I wish Iran good luck and I hope that they could find a way to shorten the test period and I hope that in fact they get there. On the other hand, uh, if there is still a path through here, and I think there is, uh, if you want to take whatever time and whatever rush uh, to continue to work the, the old reactor, fine. I think there are real possibilities since there is new technology for these kinds of reactors which only uses three and a half percent enrichment, why not go there? Those new reactors are much more efficient. So Iran's plan was to build three reactors like the medical isotope reactor. If one new one at three and a half percent will do it, why not? So we need to get ahead of the game. I will only tell you one thing. In 1994, I was ambassador in Moscow. And one of my principal jobs was to convince the Russians uh, that Iran should have no nuclear program at all. Thank and you. The Russians. <laughs> <laughs> you, well, you know how, you know how successful I am. <laughs> the Russians said, with some justification, well, they're members of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. There isn't anything that we see that has not been done in Iran in accordance with the treaty. They've kept the treaty as the Russians saw it. Uh, so they should go ahead and decide we want to sell a reactor. Uh, and if we sell a reactor, we'll follow the best of all practices. We will not provide the, the re reactor unless we provide the fuel, right. which means Iran doesn't have to enrich. And we take away the spent fuel. We haven't talked about that, but spent right. fuel contains plutonium. And chemical processes of separation, if you own the spent fuel, mean that you can move right away. There's mm -hmm. no enrichment level to be increased. Mm -hmm. It's just out of the box. So it's a very dangerous commodity. Uh, and I wrote to my friends in Washington a cable, and I said, for too long we have proposed, two years too late, the proposal that might work with respect to the Iranian program because the Iranian program has always stayed ahead of what it is we proposed. Uh, and I said, time to get ahead. Let's propose uh, that we go ahead and accept an Iranian program, but tell them that we will provide all the fuel, as the Russians did. If I were you, Tom, I would tell Washington, you people proposed in 1960s for Iran to have 23 power plants yes. within the year 2000. This was the proposal the U.S. made. Now, instead of Russians, they also can share with Iranians, they can build nuclear power plants. They Europe. want to, but I, 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 that's, Why a, not? that's a different problem. At the moment, you have proposed again 20 reactors. The problem is I don't see any contracts yet. Uh, hopefully, you'll go to the Russians. In the meantime, you have five tons of low enriched uranium for which you have absolutely no purpose. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that raises the problem. And you and I know that problem because you and I have discussed it. And my own view is any deal will have to settle what it is you're going to do with all this fuel you've made at all these billions of dollars for which you have no purpose. Yeah, we want to export it to US. Let's find that. We'll buy it. <laughs> <We're done. laughs> I'll take it tomorrow. <laughs> It's a great idea. No, but but, but the reality is no, right. but, but the reality is that the nuclear That's a grander issue, bargain than we have seen. Yes. <laughs> the, the, the reality um, is the nuclear issue is subsidiary issue of Iran West relations. Yeah. And Iran West relations is a subsidiary issue of Iran US relations. Yeah. The time Shah was there, the US decided to nuclearize Iran. The U.S. made the first nuclear uh, uh, research Just reactor. Research. Mm -hmm. The U.S. proposed Iran to have full fuel cycle. The U.S. proposed Iran to have 23 Hussein, power plants. It's called blowback. No, no. Uh, uh, if, if, if I go a little bit further, today, the U.S. has strategic relations with countries like Pakistan, India, Israel, which even they are not member of NPTs, and they possess nuclear weapons. 
True. And the U.S. has managed all sanctions and pressures against Iran, which does not have nuclear weapons and is member of NPT. And I would just add that you're entirely right, that the U.S.-Iranian relationship, without adding a lot of hubris to the question, is very important. The really surprising thing was when your foreign minister came uh, to New York, he announced publicly there will be no bilateral conversations between the United States and Iran. Because they failed during Ahmadinejad. They sure. approached many, many times. The U.S. was not ready. And, uh, but are look, we ready look, now, both look, of us? Look, look <laughs> the, the, the principles are very important. <laughs> If the U.S. is really after non-proliferation, why the amount of sanctions today against Iran is more than the amount of sanctions against North Korea, while the North Korea withdrew from NPT and tested the nuclear bomb? And Jose. Iran is a member of NPT and doesn't have nuclear bomb. Jose. I think it's a bad comparison. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. you should have compared Pakistan and India. Should you become yeah. communist? Well, no, I mean, North Korea, uh, we have ultimate sanctions, so, mm. yeah. Let me... Uh, you don't want North Korean sanctions? No. No. No, no we want uh, the U.S. to be fair. Well, let me uh, try to wind things up a little bit. There is one topic that uh, we'll use our remaining time on uh, a bit here, because it hasn't come up and it has been in a number of, of uh, questions here and that is the role of Israel uh, on many dimensions, uh, the role of Israel with regard to U.S. policy and so forth. But I want to actually focus on, on two aspects. Uh, one is uh, your sense, uh, I'd like to get your sense about, uh, Tom, you had mentioned you think there's time, uh, time before a purported uh, possibility of an Israeli strike against Iran. So I'd like to hear both of you talk about sort of, uh, you know, your level of threat or think of the level of risk is with regard to Israel bombing Iran. The other question, though, is a little broader, and that comes up in, in a number of uh, uh, questions here. It has to do with the issue of commenting on a double standard, which I think is partly what what Hossein was getting at, but this is a slightly different angle, and that is the issue that Israel is a nuclear power. It's not a declared nuclear power, but everybody knows it's a nuclear power. And so the question uh, comes actually uh, on this part to you, Tom, and given that you have been um, ambassador in many places, including to Israel, to Jordan, and to the UN, uh, as well as obviously being a, a consummate U.S. Uh, we missed him diplomat. in Tehran. <laughs> we missed him terribly in Tehran. We are paying for it's it now. It's not too late. I know. It's not too but the, late. Question, it's not too late. the question is if you put your shoes on the ground in uh, Tel Aviv, in Jordan, at the U.N., uh, does it look like there's, the U.S. has a double standard with regard to nuclear issues and Israel? There's no question that the United States at the time that Israel was supposed to, I'm going to be careful in my phrase, supposed to have become a nuclear power. Yes. Uh, and did not act the way it did with respect to India or to Pakistan mm -hmm. or to, the, to North Korea. Uh, it did not act either the same way with respect to China, interestingly enough. Right. Or France or the UK. So which double standard do you want to apply? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a serious mistake for Israel to declare itself as a nuclear power. It gives us more opportunities, if I could say, to work in the longer term future mm -hmm. on a nuclear free Middle East. And I hope in the, in the mm -hmm. longer future on a nuclear free world. Mm -hmm. I think that that raises the question of standards. It seems to me that a creative idea would be that respect with respect to enrichment. The five nuclear powers, which have taken a unilateral pledge to each other, no longer to produce material for use in nuclear weapons, as unilateral statements, should adopt with respect to enrichment at least, a pledge to incorporate 
a greater application of IAEA supervision and at the same time open up their enrichment for multilateral investment. Not that the technology would pass, but people would be present and know in fact what the boards were deciding with respect to the general question of how enrichment was provided. And enrichment, as you know, in the United States mm -hmm. is a governmental corporation. Right. Pieces of which could well be sold off. In the present crisis, it would not necessarily be a terrible idea. So that would then set a standard. It would set a standard that enrichment is limited to civil uses only. It would set a standard that enrichment is open to multilateralization. It should be pursued. And then enrichment, because it's a so-called sensitive technology, it has application both for civil nuclear power and other kinds of civil pursuits, as well as for military pursuits, is being pursued under IAEA inspection, which then tracks the material so that it is assured that it is going only for civil purposes. If we were to do that, that would hopefully close what is now a loophole in the NPT, which says, in fact, there are no limitations on enrichment unless, in fact, you cross the line to a nuclear weapon, whatever that is. Well, there are, in military purposes, still some residual uses for highly enriched uranium. Naval propulsion plants were reducing the level of enrichment, but they required high level enrichment. So you have a confusion here. And the more that people take civil programs, like India and Pakistan, and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which is neither democratic nor people's nor republic, uh, and use or misuse, and they were members of the NPT. They're NPT programs to make nuclear weapons. You can understand how suspicions arise. And we ought to be careful about not setting double standards where we say to Brazil, yes, perfectly fine, you go ahead and rich, no limitations, do what you want. And we tell Iran, no, never, not you know, one inch. Uh, and we don't seek to find a way to strengthen the entire international regime by taking the lead with Russia and with China, with France and with Britain, all of whom are already committed not to do this and formalize it and make it into something that is monitorable and continuing and more permanent than just unilateral moratorium. And I think this would be a great step forward. It would be a great step forward because for a long time we have wanted to convert these unilateral moratoriums into a treaty relationship. Mm. And this would be the beginning of that effort. That has been blocked so far uh, in the forum in which it has to take place because all of the members of that forum have a veto over what could be taken up and our good friends in Pakistan are standing in the way of moving in this direction for obvious reasons. They don't wish uh, to stop using their sensitive technologies mm. to work in their military programs, as indeed India did in a partial way when we were able to get them to separate for the first right. time military and civil, but it hasn't gone all the way. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I can't believe it, but actually on the topic you've managed to end on a quasi-positive note. Oh, we're working at it. Another uh, hour or two, maybe we'll be yeah. really positive here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, on that point, I'd like to ask Hossein, since Tom has said he's optimistic, but also he said he didn't know how to be any other way. In fact, it might even be lunacy. Um, with regard to the, to the process that's about to get underway, how would you describe your own intuition about whether the time is right to actually make a break into something new? Yeah, definitely I believe the time is right. Uh, the very positive issue is the U.S., European, Israeli intelligence consensus on three major issues. One, Iran does not have nuclear bomb. Second, Iran has not decided to make nuclear bomb. Third, 
even if Iran decides to do so, it takes years. Mm -hmm. This is consensus. There is one more which the US uh, intelligence institutions, they believe, some Europeans and also Israelis, they doubt. Americans, they believe Iran, uh, Iran even doesn't have clandestine nuclear facilities. Therefore, this is four very positive issue. If you ask me why Iran now has become threat number one, I cannot answer you. <laughs> but we have time. Tom mentioned a very, very important issue. It was a period in 1980s, 1990s, the US position was no nuclear power plant. <coughs> Iran resisted and could win. Then the US changed the position. Nuclear power plan, yes, no enrichment. The reason we failed with Europeans to reach an agreement, because the US position was zero enrichment. Iran resisted. Now the US is bargaining with Iran over 20%. This is not a, a, a right way for bargaining. Yeah. It's better to, to uh, go from the beginning to NPT, to respect the rights of Iran on their NPT, and ask Iran all commitments on their NPT. And Israel, I believe Israel is not a good candidate to discuss about Iranian nuclear issue. And what, 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 Ever they discuss more, this would be more counterproductive. Israel should not forget is not member of NPT and does have nuclear bomb. And a country which is not committed to international rules and regulations and has violated all international rules and, violations, uh, and regulations cannot threaten Iran, a member of NPT which does not have nuclear weapon, to attack Iran. I think Israel, I heard Obama has told Netanyahu do not talk about Iran. Mm -hmm. I would support Obama. <laughs> uh, we will actually but, won't go too public with that. It might not help his re-election campaign. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, but, but the long-term long solution for Israel, Iran, Middle East issue on, on nuclear Mm -hmm. is nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East. I think first they should agree to settle Iranian nuclear program based on no nuclear weapon in Iran, which Iran is ready. Iran is ready for every commitment that Iran would stay forever non-nuclear weapon state. Use this opportunity. This is my message to P5 plus one. But in order to, rem to remove the, the, uh, the, the instability or all discussion about racing the other countries for nuclear weapon and so and so, yeah. be more serious on the initiative of nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East. Thank you. Well, I think you know that's extremely positive. I, I, Hussein is more optimistic than I am. Oh mm. my God. Whoa. You've I, witnessed it, folks. And I'm, glad he, I'm glad he brought out the three areas of agreement. It was better that he recognized it than I have to force it. Right. But I agree entirely. <laughs> right. Well, let me just conclude. First of all, I do apologize. I wasn't able to get to all of your questions. Did the best I could with the time I had. But that's, these why you guys, need to, that's why you need to invite us again. We need to invite them again. I think that's exactly the but right way But maybe we got the it. answers without the questions. You know, <laughs> that's the other option. Anyway, please uh, join me in thanking them and in February. Uh, thank you indeed to all of our panelists. Uh, we began the night by uh, hearing uh, why war would be a, a tragic mistake between uh, Iran and the West. And, and uh, the long journey uh, of mistrust and miscommunication and misperceptions that got us to this point. Uh, but as the night progressed, we certainly heard a lot of ideas, positive ideas for how to move forward and how to find our way through the mess. And, and that's hopeful to 
all of us in the world, in an inter increasingly interconnected world, who depend on uh, global peace and security for our own well-being. Certainly, of course, to Canadians who, uh, whose military engaged in the first Gulf War and uh, whose military did its share and, and possibly more in Afghanistan. And, and, and we could certainly imagine ourselves uh, swept up in any new conflagration. And so uh, it was very uh, a good thing for us to hear uh, people with deep insights into the region, including our two ambassadors. Um, uh, talk about the way forward. Um, certainly, uh, um, when you suggested that we might want to fly you to Istanbul, I thought that was uh, an interesting idea, but I'd be more interested in having the whole group in Istanbul come here and play with their well, negotiations yeah. on our stage. Uh, uh, speaking personally for myself, as a result of this excellent discussion, if you'll forgive me for saying this, uh, um, I experienced not three, not 20, but 100% enrichment. And, and so to Ambassador uh, Hussein Mousavi and Thomas Pickering, and also to uh, Jim and Janet for uh, not only moderating so skillfully, but for making tonight possible, organizing it and convening this excellent panel. I think we all owe one more round of thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So just very quickly, um, a few brief notes before we adjourn. Uh, the video from today's live webcast will be edited and posted to our website in an online video archive. I'd like to say thanks once again to our sponsors, 570 News and Wordsworth Books. Our next event uh, will be here again in the CG Auditorium on May 24th, May 24th for an event entitled, uh, titled The Responsibility to Protect and the Arab Spring. And this event will feature Lloyd Axworthy, Canada's former Minister of Foreign Affairs, who became internationally known for his advancement of the human security concept. He'll be joined by CG Senior Fellow Besma Momani, who's been a frequent commentator in the media with regard to the Arab Spring. And on May 30th, uh, join us for our annual media panel, co-sponsored by the Canadian International Council, a Waterloo Region branch. This year, our theme is Bordered Biases, National Identity and World News Coverage. And the panel features TVO's uh, Steve Pakin, host of The Agenda, CPC's Diana Swain, uh, Ryerson University's Tony Berman, who was the first managing editor of Al Jazeera English, Mitch Potter of the Toronto Star's Washington Bureau, and Kevin Carmichael of the Globe and Mail's Washington Bureau. So it promises to be an amazing panel. Be sure to register for our events newsletter for information on all of our other upcoming lectures. And thank you once again for coming to CG tonight. We hope to see you soon. The distinguished New York Times foreign correspondent and the author of several books on Iran has described the U.S.-Iran situation as the wor world's worst dysfunctional relationship between nations. How dysfunctional is it? I know of no better statement of the pitiful level of non-communication and ignorance that has plagued the relationship than that of John Limbert, a retired American diplomat, a former advisor to President Barack Obama on Iran, who was also, from November 1979 until January 1981, held hostage by Islamic militants in and around the U.S. Embassy grounds in Tehran. Here are John Limbert's five rules of dysfunctionality that he contends have governed past negotiations, formal and informal, between Iran and the West. Rule number one, never walk through an open door. Instead, bang your head against a wall. Rule number two, never say yes to anything the other side proposes, because doing so will make you look weak. Three, always assume the other side is infinitely hostile, devious, domineering, and irrational, and that it is, in fact, the embodiment of evil. Four. Always assume that anything the other side proposes must contain some kind of a trick, that its only purpose in life, actually, is to cheat you. Five, whenever you seem to be succeeding, take a deep breath, close your eyes, and when you open them, accuse the other side of a conspiracy so vast, of coincidences so improbable that you are convinced that this time the evil adversary is out not just to make you look bad, not just to embarrass you or trap you, this time he is out to totally destroy you. These are the conclusions of a U.S. diplomat, fluent in Farsi, married to an Iranian woman who has spent the better part of the last 40 years working in and around <coughs> Iran. To succeed in the negotiation set to begin on Saturday in Istanbul, the principal parties around in the United States have to break all these rules. 
Tonight, we are going to provide the negotiators in Istanbul with a model for how these rules can be productively broken by Iranian and American diplomats. We're going to show you that it can happen. Our guests will engage each other in a dialogue dedicated to helping us understand how Iran and the West got to where they are now, bitter enemies, full of mistrust, unyielding in their positions, and maybe even willing, so it seems, to go to the brink of catastrophic war, or maybe even over that brink, as a matter of inclination and a matter of policy. I've told our guests that they can begin their discussion by focusing on the present moment and working their way back through some of that history that has brought us to this point, or they can begin with the history and work their way forward as they see fit. The conversation you're about to witness and then later participate in will be relatively unstructured and informal. It will be a dialogue of the sort we hope transpires at the official level between Tehran and Washington beginning on Saturday. We will leave a substantial portion of our time for our guests to respond to questions from the audience. Volunteers will be passing out pencils and paper on which we ask you to write a brief question and pass it to the aisle, either aisle, where the volunteers will retrieve them. Please specify if your question is for Ambassador Musavian or Ambassador Pickering or both. The volunteers will deliver them to the aforementioned Janet Lang, who will, according, uh, who will organize them according to theme and give them to our guests who will answer them to the best of their ability, or since they are professional diplomats, pretend to answer them to the best of their ability. <laughs> it is a great pleasure now to formally introduce my fellow panel members. Janet M. Lang is a research professor at the Balsillie School and the History Department at the University of Waterloo. She has two books coming out in the next six months, Becoming Enemies, U.S.-Iran Relations and the Iran-Iraq War, 1979-1988. That'll be published in June. And the Armageddon Letters, How Kennedy, Khrushchev, and Castro Saved Us in the Cuban Missile Crisis, which will be published shortly before the 50th anniversary in October. I had the distinct honor to assist her on both of these books. <laughs> Janet will take charge of the Q&A period at w with which we will conclu conclude the evening. Like the other members of this panel, Janet considers herself a moderate. I have insider knowledge gained over 36 years of our marriage <laughs> and collaboration that she is indeed moderate on some subjects. <laughs> but these do not include sports teams from her hometown of Boston, <laughs> where she takes no prisoners, nor the proper way to make red sauce for pasta, where there is only one way, and that's mom's way. <laughs> Sayed Hossein Musavian is currently a visiting research scholar at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. Hossein has worked as a journalist, diplomat, nuclear negotiator, and scholar over the course of a distinguished career. From 1980 to 1990, he was editor-in-chief of the Daily Tehran Times. By the end of the 1980s, he was director general of the Western European Department of the Iranian Foreign Ministry. He subsequently served as ambassador to the newly reunified Germany from 1990 to 1997, and later as head of the Foreign Relations Committee of the Supreme National Security Council. From 2005 to 2008, Hussein served as vice president of the Center for Strategic Research, a foreign policy think tank quite like CG next door that Janet and I had the privilege to visit in 2008. In April 2007, he was arrested and charged with actions contrary to Iran's national security interests. He was cleared on charges of espionage and revealing secret documents to Western officials. But given a two-year suspended... Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG, as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs at CG. Besides the audience here tonight, we also have a global audience watching on the live webcast. Our topic this, after, this evening is Iran in the West, a dialogue of ambassadors, and will be presented by former American Ambassador Thomas Pickering and former Iranian Ambassador Hossein Musavian. Our featured speakers will be introduced more properly in just a few moments by our event moderators. 
Following today's address, we welcome your questions from the audience. Here in the CG Auditorium, you have question cards and pencils that we ask you to fill out and pass to the end of the aisle. We'll accept these at two different times this evening, once at 8 o'clock and again at 8.30. If you're watching online, you can ask questions through the live chat function on your screen and we'll transmit those questions to our panel. I'd like to thank CG's public event sponsors, 570 News and Wordsworth Books. Uh, thank you for your continuing support. And I'd also like to acknowledge in our audience Peter Braid, elected Member of Parliament for Kitchener-Waterloo. Moderating this evening's discussion are Janet Lang, Research Professor at the Balsley School of International Affairs, and James Blight, the CG Chair in Foreign Policy Development at the Balsley School. Jim and Janet, who are <coughs> both colleagues and spouses, are also both award-winning authors, scholars, and experts in critical oral history. Recognized as world-leading specialists on American foreign policy during the Cold War and the Cuban Missile Crisis, they were heavily involved in the making of two recent award-winning films, The Fog of War, 11 Lessons from the Life of Robert S. McNamara, and Virtual JFK, Vietnam, If Kennedy Had Lived. They're the authors of several publications. They've led groundbreaking projects on preventing nuclear war, and they're continuing their research on the Cuban Missile Crisis through a new project called The Armageddon Letters, which you can learn more about by visiting www.armageddonletters.com. A recent focus of the research is U.S.-Iran relations since the Islamic Revolution, undertaken with colleagues at MIT and George Washington University. They came to Waterloo from Brown University not long ago, and we feel very lucky to have Jim and Janet conducting the research here at the CG campus, and we're fortunate to have them on stage tonight. So I ask that you please help me to welcome both Janet Lang and James Blight, who will introduce this evening's speakers. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Fred. Good evening on this fine winter's night in April. <laughs> and welcome to the CG campus and to the Balsilli School of International Affairs. I'm jail sentenced and barred for five years from serving in Iran's diplomatic corps because of his opposition to the nuclear and foreign policy of the administration of President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Thomas R. Pickering is currently vice chair of Hills and Company, an international consulting firm providing advice to U.S. businesses focused on emerging market economies. Ambassador Pickering is one of the most honored Foreign Service officers in U.S. history. During a Foreign Service career of more than 40 years, he served as ambassador to, in chronological order, Jordan, Nigeria, El Salvador, Israel, the United Nations, India, and Russia. He retired in 2000 as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, he holds the personal rank of career ambassador, the highest in the U.S. Foreign Service. Tom has been centrally, I would even say heroically, involved in our project on Iran in the West, Janet's and mine, from its inception in 2006. According to his State Department resume, Tom speaks French, Spanish, Swahili, Arabic, and Hebrew. Tonight, however, we have asked him to limit himself to his native New Jersey English. <laughs> <laughs> a language he shares with two other New Jersey heroes of Janet and me, that would be John Stewart and Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> now, to begin, I'd like to invite Hussein and Tom to begin to mix it up. The floor is yours. I understand that Tom lost the flip of the coin and therefore he goes first. Please. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Jim and Janet very much for inviting us here and let me tell you what an honor and pleasure it is to be back on a platform again with a person I'm privileged to call a friend and someone who I admire and respect and who's taught me a great deal, Hussein Moussavian, who, uh, from whom you will shortly hear. Jim has introduced us with multiple challenges out ahead. Uh, let me just state at the outset that I believe that our relationship has been characterized, indeed our non-relationship has been characterized by mistrust, which goes deep, fed by misunderstanding, which relates very heavily uh, to the fact that each side 
is left to interpret the actions and the roles of the other side on the basis of distance and non-conversation rather than the alternative. It is my view that a war would be a huge, tragic mistake and that we must strive to move toward diplomacy, toward dialogue, toward conversation and negotiation, something that has eluded us for a long period of time. Our relationship, and I studied history, so I'm going to begin back and come forward, has been characterized over the years, particularly since Blight, as Fred has just suggested. Our subject is Iran and the West. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, it feels to us as if Iran, the West, and the entire world have arrived at a watershed moment. Perched on the edge of a precipice, this way leading to peace, that way leading to war. On the one hand, we wonder, dare we be hopeful about the talks that commence this coming Saturday between Iran and the so-called P5 plus one, permanent members of the UN Security Council, all nuclear powers, and Germany. On February 22nd, Iranian Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei reiterated his August 2005 fatwa concerning the prohibition of nuclear weapons, asserting that it is immoral, illogical, and sinful to, to possess nuclear weapons, and that Iran, therefore, does not seek such weapons. In response, as we are told, U.S. President Barack Obama has sent a back-channel message to Hamane via the Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan, reportedly containing the following proposal. The U.S. will tolerate a nuclear-capable Iran as long as Iran devotes that program strictly to civilian use and is sufficiently transparent to allow inspectors to confirm this on a regular basis. So we ask at this treacherous moment, have Hamane and Obama broken the ice somehow? Does this exchange mean an agreement and thus peace may be possible? Can a war be avoided? Can decades of fear, loathing, and mistrust be overcome? Or will this initiative crash and burn as it has in the past, indeed, as it did last year? If the talks do collapse, many believe there will be war. Israel has threatened to attack Iran whether the U.S. approves or not, or whether it participates or not. Such a war, it is widely believed, would plunge the Middle East into a chaotic bloodbath with vast implications not only for Iran and the Middle East, but for the entire world. Immense pressure is already being applied to Iran via a regime of sanctions imposed by the West, an action often described as a last-ditch effort to avoid a catastrophic war. Iran, for its part, has credibly threatened to respond mightily to such an attack, including, but not limited to, attempting to close the Strait of Hormuz through which nearly one quarter of the world's oil passes. With so much at stake and with such dire predictions of catastrophe in the event of war, why don't the potential combatants take a step back, pause, and engage each other on alternatives to war or capitulation? The brief answer seems to be that Iran and the West have become prisoners of their history. <clears throat> Stephen Kinzer, the